Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're um, navigating the often underappreciated world of venous complications in vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. we got some great sources, chapters from Rutherford's Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy as our guides here. Yeah, the definitive text, really. Exactly. And our mission, essentially, is to uncover the, well, sometimes surprising ways veins get affected during medical procedures. Right. What the consequences are, how these things are handled. Think of it as your shortcut to understanding a really critical, maybe sometimes overlooked, aspect of surgical care. That's a good way to put it. We're definitely going beyond just the theory. These chapters dig into the real world frequency, the different forms they take. Diagnosis management. Diagnosis management strategies, exactly. It's a pretty comprehensive look at something vital for patient well-being. Okay, let's dive right in then. How often do these complications actually uh, happen? Well, let's start with DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Right, most people have heard of that. Yeah. But what might be surprising is that it's the most common venous issue after surgery, or even just being generally unwell. And specifically for vascular surgery. The reported rates can be really high, up to 20%, according to the sources. 20%? That's, that's a lot. It is. And, you know, what's also striking is even less invasive things, like a standard venous puncture. Like drawing blood or starting an IV. Sort of, yeah, or gaining access for procedures. Without preventative anticoagulation, blood thinners, during cardiac procedures, the DVT incidence could hit 60%. 60? Wow. And even in patients who already have clots and are getting IVC filters put in, the risk of another DVT after that procedure is around 36%. Okay, so the venous system is clearly quite vulnerable. Very much so. And it's not just about clots forming after the fact, like DVT. There's direct injury too, right? Yeah. Damage to the vein itself. Absolutely. That's common in trauma penetrating wounds, things like that, up to 28%, often along with artery damage. Okay, trauma makes sense. But what about during other planned surgeries, iatrogenic injuries? Yes, those are less reported, but they can be severe. There's a Mayo Clinic study mentioned. I saw that. It sounded quite serious. It was. 44 injuries during major abdominal surgery. The average blood loss was nearly 4 liters. 4 liters. And an 18% mortality rate associated with those injuries. It's a stark reminder. Definitely. And with more procedures being done endovascularly now through the vessels. Exactly. Less invasive overall, but it brings its own set of issues, particularly at the access site where they go in. So more complications there. Well, the number of these peripheral vascular interventions has shot up like tenfold since the mid-90s, and access site complications happen in maybe 1 to 11 percent of cases. So a decent chunk. It adds up. And even placing a central line, which is incredibly common, right. carries a risk of direct vein injury. And we need to look out for subtle signs, too, not just the obvious bleeding. Right. The text mentioned hypotension, low blood pressure. Yes. If someone's blood pressure drops after a percutaneous procedure, one done through the skin, you have to think, could there be a hematoma, a collection of blood, somewhere else? Like hidden bleeding. Exactly. And specifically after femoral access in the groin area, if hemoglobin drops and the patient has lower abdominal or flank pain. Back pain. Yeah, or side pain. That could signal a retroperitoneal hematoma, bleeding behind the lining of the abdomen. Okay, so high vigilance is absolutely crucial then. Precisely. And digging a bit more into that direct venous injury, it's interesting, isolated injuries during surgery might actually be underreported. How so? Well, if a surgeon nicks a small vein during dissection and just repairs it quickly or ties it off, and there's no major bleeding or instability, it might not get formally documented. I see. Unless it's a big problem. Right. But you can minimize the risk, good technique, obviously, yeah. and identifying high-risk patients. Like who? People with obesity, if you need to use a large sheath for access, if they've had catheters there before, or if they're on anticoagulants, those all increase the chances. Makes sense. And for those access procedures, like central lines or endovascular work, ultrasound guidance is key now, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Ultrasound guidance and using the Seldinger technique, the standard guide wire method, are really best practice. They reduce that risk of direct injury significantly. So you can see exactly where you're going. Pretty much, yeah. It allows much more precise access. Now, if an injury does happen, especially with percutaneous access, a hematoma is often the main sign. Swelling, bruising. Swelling, pain, bruising, maybe persistent oozing from the site, or even that drop in blood pressure we mentioned. And just seeing hematoma isn't enough, is it? Yeah. You need to investigate further. Often, yes. Duplex ultrasound is frequently needed, especially if the hematoma feels like it's 
pulsing. Pulsatal. Yeah. Or if you can hear a whooshing sound, a brute with the stethoscope, or if it's really tender. Why? What are you looking for? You need to rule out an arterial pseudoaneurysm, a contained rupture in an artery nearby, or an AV fistula, an abnormal connection between an artery and the vein. Got it. So the ultrasound helps differentiate. It does. It might not see the venous leak directly, but it sees a hematoma, and it can see if the vein is being compressed or if there's a clot thrombosis forming because of the injury. And those retroperitoneal hematomas you mentioned from femoral axis. Right. The diagnosis there is often more clinical because the signs can be subtle. Back pain, low blood pressure, fast heart rate, low urine output. That pattern should really raise suspicion. And prompt a CT scan. Prompt a CT scan, yes. That's usually needed to confirm it and see how much bleeding there is. Okay. So managing these direct injuries sounds like catching them early is vital, especially those access site hematomas. Absolutely key. Simple things first. Direct pressure, marking the edges of the swelling to see if it's expanding, checking hemoglobin levels regularly. And most just get better on their own. Most resolve over weeks, yeah. But sometimes, if the skin looks like it's breaking down or there's infection risk, you might need to surgically evacuate the clot or debride dead tissue. And what about those tricky retroperitina ones, especially if the patient has bleeding issues? That can be challenging. Might need aggressive resuscitation, blood products, fluids. Most are still managed conservatively, watching closely. But not always. Not always. If they remain unstable, if the blood loss continues, or if they develop neurological problems, then further imaging, maybe even surgery or endovascular treatment might be needed. And it sounds like treatments are evolving, especially for complications away from the access site. Covered stents were mentioned. Yes, that's an interesting development. Using covered stents, like little internal grafts, inside the vein to seal off injuries, it's potentially a safer option than open surgery, particularly for high-risk patients or central veins. Mm, okay. Now, thinking about open surgery, if a vein is injured during an operation, how is that handled? It really depends on the size of the injury in the vein. Small tears or holes might just need some pressure to stop the bleeding. And bigger ones. Bigger ones often need suture repair, usually with very fine non-reactive sutures. The key thing is to handle the vein gently, avoid aggressive clamping, which can cause more damage. Can you just tie off a vein if it's badly damaged? Legation. You can for some veins like maybe the brachiocephalic in the chest, internal jugular, subclavian, or veins in the limbs if the vein on the other side is open and working well. But generally repair is preferred if you can do it. And for the really big veins, vena cava femoral vein. If you can repair them directly without narrowing the vein too much, that's ideal. Usually a transverse closure with suture. What if closing it directly would narrow it? Then you need a patch, like bovine pericardium tissue from a cow's heart sac for the vena cava, or maybe a piece of another vein for smaller vessels that maintains the diameter. And are there endovascular options for big vein injuries too, like the vena cava? Yes, increasingly so. Using balloons inside the vein to temporarily control bleeding balloon occlusion and placing covered stents is also becoming more common, especially in hybrid operating rooms with good imaging. But sizing the stent correctly sounds tricky in an injured vein. It can be, yeah. That's a technical challenge. What about injuries to the back of the vena cava? They sound difficult to get to. They are. One technique mentioned is actually opening the front of the vena cava, an anterior cavotomy, and then repairing the back wall from the inside. Clever. And if a large chunk of vein is just gone, too damaged to repair. If the patient is stable enough, you can replace it, either with prosthetic grafts like artificial tubes. Like for arteries? Similar idea, yeah, maybe 20, 24 millimeter grafts for the vena cava. Or you can create a graft using the patient's own vein, spiraled around. But these often require long-term anticoagulation afterwards. Right, to prevent clotting in the graft. It really highlights the stakes with major vein injuries. Especially injuries high up on the vena cava, near the liver or above it. Those have very high morbidity and mortality rates. Okay, let's shift gears slightly. Arteriovenous fistulas AVFs. What are those exactly? An AVF is an abnormal direct connection between an artery and a vein, bypassing the normal capillary network. And how do they happen? Classically, from penetrating trauma, a stab wound, for instance, injuring both vessels side by side. But also from procedures? Increasingly, yes. Vascular cannulation during percutaneous procedures is a big cause now. Needle going through both artery and vein. How common is that? The overall incidence is still pretty low, maybe 0.00006% up to almost 0.9%, depending on the procedure. But it's not just vascular procedures, right? No. 
They can happen after total knee replacements, lumbar disc surgery in the back, even biopsies, like kidney transplant biopsies. Okay. And this all circles back, in a way, to venous thrombosis, doesn't it? Clot formation. It does. DVT is always a risk after any kind of venous injury or intervention. Even the pressure bandage after a procedure. Well, the compression used after procedures like IVC filter placement can actually predispose to thrombus formation in the access vein. And just putting instruments inside a vein. Activates the clotting cascade. It's trauma to the vein lining, so sticking wires, catheters, balloons in there. It all increases the risk. Surgical repair sites can also be places where clots form. Right. Now, what about complications specifically from trying to fix venous problems endovascularly, like angioplasty or stenting veins? Yeah, those procedures are crucial for things like keeping dialysis access open. The outflow or central stenosis. Exactly. Or treating Mae-Thurner syndrome, that iliac vein compression or post-thrombotic syndrome. Stenting blocked iliac veins or the vena cava can actually help heal chronic leg ulcers too. But what can go wrong during those procedures? Well, one major risk is venous rupture, especially if you're using high-pressure balloons to open up a tough blockage, or in veins that have been arterialized for dialysis access, they're just not used to that pressure. No, the vein can tear open. It can. Another issue is stent migration. The stent moves after you place it. Yes, especially in the big, compliant central veins. They can expand and contract more. So getting the size right, often needing intravascular ultrasound, IVUS, for accurate measurement inside the vessel, and placing it precisely, maybe with stents that have anchoring mechanisms, is really important. Okay. And wire perforation? Less common, but possible, especially when trying to get through chronic, long-standing blockages. The wire can potentially poke through the vein wall. And I thought this was really interesting, the pain issue with some newer iliac vein stents. Ah, yes. The ones designed specifically for veins, often nitinol based with higher outward force. They sit near the genital femoral nerve in the pelvis. And can irritate it. Apparently so. Can cause pain, sometimes for days, sometimes for months. Patients really need to be warned about that possibility beforehand. Definitely good to know. How are these endovascular complications usually spotted? Many of them, like a stent migration or a major perforation, are pretty obvious right away during the procedure on the imaging. Okay. And maybe hematoma afterwards in the leg. A hematoma in the treated limb could certainly be a sign, yeah. How do you manage a venous rupture if it happens during the procedure? Fortunately, most are self-limiting. Often, just inflating a balloon at low pressure across the tear for five minutes or more balloon tamponade is enough to stop the bleeding. And if that doesn't work? Then you might need to place a covered stent to seal the hole, or sometimes even a bare metal stent can scaffold the area enough. What about migrated stents? Can you get them back? Often, yes. Percutaneously, using snares and catheters through the veins. Grab it and pull it out. But sometimes surgery is needed. Sometimes, if the percutaneous approach fails, or depending on where it ended up, surgery might be required to remove it, possibly with vein reconstruction. And you mentioned embolization devices, coils and plugs used to block veins. They can migrate too. They can. Vein diameters can change, veins can spasm. So a coil or plug placed somewhere might move, potentially to the heart or lungs, which is serious. Where is this a particular risk? Placing them in the internal iliac veins in the pelvis needs caution. The advice is often to anchor them first, by putting smaller coils in branch vessels to hold the main device securely. Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about IVC filters now. Inferior vena cava filters, placed to stop clots traveling to the lungs. Right, prevent pulmonary embolism, PE. But the placement itself can have issues. Yes, a whole list. Putting it in the wrong place, causing a pneumothorax at accessing from the neck or chest, hematoma at the access site, air embolism, creating an AV fistula, causing a clot at the insertion site, even accidentally puncturing the carotid artery if using a neck approach. Wow, quite a range. Okay. And then there are late complications, problems that show up later. Yeah. The filter itself can clot off IVC thrombosis. Clots can form on the filter and then pieces can break off and embolize past the filter. The filter struts can fracture. Or they can perforate through the wall of the vena cava into adjacent organs. Like the bowel. Like the bowel or the aorta or vertebrae, yeah. In filter migration, moving from its spot. Yes, especially migration towards the heart. That's a really dangerous one. High morbidity and mortality. What causes that? Often due to putting in a filter that's too small for the patient's vena cava diameter 
Or sometimes, if wires are manipulated near the filter during later procedures, like changing outlines. So proper sizing and careful technique later are key for prevention. Absolutely critical. How do you diagnose these filter problems? Migration. Migration might be seen during the placement if it happens acutely, or later on imaging if the patient develops symptoms or for other reasons. And thrombosis, the filter clotting off. Best seen with a CT venogram, a CT timed for venous phase contrast, or a traditional venogram with dye injection. And those late issues like fracture or perforation? Often found, incidentally. Patient gets a C2 scan for something else, and oops, there's a filter strut poking out or broken. So managing filter migration, prevention is best, obviously. Proper sizing. Proper sizing, careful planning. And if you do need to exchange wires near an existing filter, doing it under direct fluoroscopy, watching it on the x-ray screen, helps limit manipulation. But if it does migrate, how do you get it out? Usually try percutaneously first. Access from the neck vein, maybe the femoral vein too. Use large sheaths, buddy wires for support, snares, special catheters. Sometimes you have to kind of collapse or crush the filter to get it into the sheath. Sounds complex. It can be. If that fails, especially if it's lodged in the pulmonary artery, open heart surgery might be needed. Robotic removal is also emerging as an option sometimes. What about those perforations found incidentally? If the patient has no symptoms. Often they're just monitored. If it's asymptomatic, intervention might carry more risk than benefit. But if it is causing symptoms, like punching into the duodenum, then it likely needs to come out and the organ needs to be repaired. And the thrombosed filter mm -hmm. clotted off. What are consequences? That often presents with bad leg swelling, both legs usually, can lead to chronic post-phlebitic syndrome, really severe swelling called phlegmasia, even kidney failure if the clot extends up high. So not good. Not good at all. The patency of filters tends to decrease over time anyway, so the recommendation is generally to remove filters when they're no longer needed, if it's safe to do so. Can you treat a thrombose filter? Sometimes. If there are no contraindications, you could consider thrombolysis clot-busting drugs potentially followed by removing the filter. For patients with chronic cavel obstruction and bad leg symptoms, complex iliocaval venous reconstruction might be an option, but that's major surgery. Okay, so pulling it all together, venous complications are basically from trauma or iatrogenic injury caused by medical procedures? Pretty much, yes. DVT is common, usually treated with anticoagulation. Correct. Direct injuries need repair or ligation depending on where they are. Mm-hmm. Based on location and severity. And those late complications, AV fistulas, device migrations, are treated based on whether they're causing problems. Exactly. Based on symptoms and clinical significance. There's actually a useful algorithm in the chapter for suspected venous injury management. Right. Well, this has been incredibly thorough, a really insightful deep dive into... Uh, what feels like a really vital area. It is, often overshadowed by arteries, maybe. Yeah, it's easy to focus on the arterial side, but the veins are clearly just as important, and the potential for complications is, well, significant. Definitely. It really hammers home the need for meticulous technique, doesn't it? And just general awareness during procedures to minimize these accidental injuries. Awareness and careful technique are paramount. And it is fascinating to see how the treatments are evolving. Endovascular options are changing the game in many ways. Absolutely. Which kind of leads to a final thought for you, the listener. Mm -hmm. Given how many medical interventions happen today, constantly increasing, what are the bigger implications of all these potential venous complications? for overall patient care, for long-term health? That's a great question. And what's next? What research or new technologies might really move the needle on reducing these risks further? Something to definitely think about. It's a complex and evolving picture.